Well, I want to thank you all for having um, this forum here tonight. I think it's a very important subject uh, for Virginia. Um, I want to explain um, the FLMI, for those of you who aren't familiar with those initials, it's a fellow the Life Management Institute, um, which is a life and health insurance um, professional designation. <coughs> And when I worked for Shenandoah Life, I was a reinsurance specialist. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the field of reinsurance, reinsurance companies insure insurance companies and other reinsurance companies. So, so the job of the field of reinsurance is to spread the risk around through the market to create stability. Um, and usually it works fairly well, um, sometimes not so much, but it depends and it's an attempt. Um, so. I'm going to be a, oops, that's very sensitive. Um, I'm going to be evaluating the context of, of the public exposure and private benefit uh, for the uranium industry in Virginia. Um, is this voice level okay? Yes. <laughs> All right. If, if, if you have trouble hearing me or you have any questions as I'm going along, just let me know and I will do my best. All right, let's talk turkey. Um, my grandfather was a reinsurance executive uh, for General Reinsurance, and he used to tell a story about how hard it was to reinsure domestic turkey farms, because domestic turkey farms had a history of when the birds got scared, they would run into a corner of the pen and they'd smother themselves and injure themselves, and that would be a loss for the farmer. So a farmer came up with this brilliant idea of building a round pen to put the turkeys in no corner for the turkeys to run in and smother themselves. Everybody thought, brilliant idea. The farmer built the pen, he put a bunch of turkeys in it, he invited these insurance and reinsurance executives out to his farm to say, see the turkeys in the pen. And everybody's like, brilliant. And while we were standing there, it just happened to be that a jet plane flew overhead, scared the turkeys, and they ran into the center of the pen and smothered themselves there. <laughs> So uh, it just goes to show that lots of times the best interventions, and, and it seems like that would make sense, actuarial doesn't actually happen in, in real life. So that's why we have the insurance industry. Every day we live with risks and benefits. I'm assuming people took a motor vehicle of some type to get here tonight. Did you all feel relatively safe doing that? You didn't. <laughs> Did you have a bad experience on the way here? No? <laughs> How many of y'all have been in a minor to major traffic accident? Pretty, pretty good. Yeah, that, that's normal. <laughs> so, um, does having insurance make you feel more secure when you're out, knowing that other people are insured, that you're insured? And over time, it's become safer to travel, right? We've got seat belts, um, airbags, uh, past laws to make things safer, such as teenagers can't text and drive, and now we're talking about if anybody should text and drive, probably not. <laughs> so, All right, I'm going to take you back in history to the Titanic, the unsinkable ship. That didn't work out too well. Um, and there was an examination of, of what happened when the Titanic um, sunk, um, one of which they had repeated warnings um, before they hit the iceberg telling them that there was ice there and to slow down, and they didn't slow down. Another was after they hit the iceberg, the person in the, I guess, engineering group sent out an SOS signal. Um, now, the SOS at that time was cutting edge, and the boats that were in the surrounding neighborhood weren't able to receive the <coughs> SOS signal. And it was after the sinking of the Titanic when 1,500 people died that they created an international standard um, making it where you had to have somebody manning the telegraph in case the SOS signal was sent out, that you would have somebody to receive it, be able to report it and respond to it. So that's something that we learned from that historically to make things safer for other people. Uh, a couple years ago, I think last year or two, there was a 100-year review of the sinking of the Titanic where they went through the historical information. And there had been a myth that the ship had poor quality construction. Um, but their examination was that the ship was really um, well designed, um, that in fact no ship of the era could have withstood the seven second contact with the iceberg for as long as the Titanic had. And it was the Titanic's immense strength that kept her afloat as long uh, as it did after the collision. But what they did find, that it was human judgment by the captain 
um, that had made the difference. If the captain had steered away from the iceberg 30 seconds earlier, it probably would not have hit the iceberg. Um, and it was a reasonable judgment call of the captain to make because earlier in his career he had held a, a ship on course instead of steering away and the ship had missed the obstacle. So um, it just goes to show that um, with human judgment sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't work out. Uh, Y'all remember the Exxon Valdez? Um, now that was an example of human negligence. Uh, the captain that was at the helm um, was drunk and left the helm um, in the hands of somebody below him that did not have the qualifications to steer that ship. It had, um, it had a collision and it was an environmental catastrophe that they're clean, still cleaning up to this day. Uh, the Miracle on the Hudson, um, Captain Sully, that many people consider a hero, was the pilot of that ship. Um, he would not call himself the hero. Um, he said that he, there was an example of the required hours of training for the worst case scenario that caused it where he had the skills to land the plane that day. And what brought the plane down was a flock of birds that hit the engines. It just was something that happened. Um, there was no loss of life. Uh, there was a loss of the airplane, but it was a pretty amazing um, achievement. Um, the Brooklyn Bridge was built in the 1890s. It was a bridge that was built to last. Um, this is a bridge um, built in more modern times in Minnesota. Um, I don't know if you remember when that collapsed, um, but the firm that was charged uh, with evaluating the bridge failed to recommend the improvements to the bridge to fix the corroded and buckling gusset plates. Uh, there's a $52 million lawsuit um, between the firm and the victim, but that did not restore the loss of life or take away the trauma from the victims. There were 111 vehicles on the collapsed portion of the bridge. There were 13 dead and 145 injured. And please notice the school bus next to the tractor trailer here, because I'm going to tie into this later. Okay. All right, there's international guidelines for defining, okay, now I'm switching to, <coughs> getting to the uranium mine. There's international guidelines for defining mineral resources. And the United States opted not to participate in the international framework classifications for mineral reserves and mineral resources. When did they opt not to do that? Um, I believe it was 1999. Thank you. Yep. Um, CRISCO um, stands for the Committee for Mineral Reserves International Reporting Standards. The committee was made up of Asian, Asia, Asian nations, <coughs> Australia, Canada, Chile, Europe, and the United States. Uh, following the agreement, the United States Society for Mining, Metallurgy, and Exploration released guidelines in 1999, as did the equivalent organizations in the other countries. However, the United States was the only country whose regulator, the Securities Exchange Commission, did not recognize the Society for Mining, Metallurgy, and Exploration reporting standard and did not agree to the CRISCO um, guidelines. <coughs> So the differences between the Security Exchange Commission and the Crisco guidelines is one. A requirement of a standardized price based upon the prevailing three years, and that's actually a good thing that they take an average. restriction on the disclosure of proved and probable mineral reserves while other mineralized material is permitted. Now this is important because the mineralized material is not clearly defined in the Securities Exchange Commission guidelines. Three, a definition of a reserve as a part of a mineral deposit which could be economically and legally extracted or produced at the time of the reserve determination. And four, no clear requirement for a competent person to define the resource or reserve. 
Now, are these the SEC guidelines that we're looking at? Yes. Okay. okay. So, um, the Securities Exchange Commission in the last decade or so has quite a reputation of not necessarily doing the best job to protect the um, entrance of our country. Uh, so, scandals, corruption, and negligence, oh my. Remember the deep water rise in 2010, and just recently British Petroleum did plead guilty to manslaughter for what happened for the deep water horizon. Bernie Madoff in 2008, there was lots of warning signs to catch him. And this is where I hear lots of times when I hear about the partnership with Virginia Uranium Inc. and the Canadian uranium industry saying, well, the Canadians are our allies. Well, Bernie Madoff was a United States citizen, and he cheated his family, friends, charities. So you have to watch out for predators wherever they are and, and protect the public from people that would be malfeasant. As far as the federal government, when we're talking about uranium mining in Virginia, we're talking about something that would affect our state for tens of thousands of years. We don't know what type of government's going to be in place at the time. We don't know what the response is. And the response for our government, government in Katrina of 2005 was extremely lacking at that time. And remember Enron from 2002. I could, I mean, there was lots I could actually pick from. I just kind of picked some that I thought were the more well-known that people might remember. But there was lots to choose from in this area. So when we do something together as a nation, we've done some extraordinary things, like the space shuttle program. Um, and when we do that, we do that as a nation. We go on um, risk together as a na nation. Um, the insurance industry did not insure the space shuttle program. That's something that we built together as our country, and we all went on risk together as our country, and we all benefited from it as a country. And we had our moments, and we had our tragedies, like the Challenger accident. But we came back, we learned from the Challenger accident, and we built a better space shuttle and continued the program until, unfortunately, just recently they shut it down. So Warren Buffett's um, organization, Berkshire Hathaway, has um, the, the um, large group that he has, has an <coughs> arm of it called the Berkshire Hathaway Reinsurance Group. And Warren Buffett was quoted in one of his annual, annual reports as saying that the Berkshire Hathaway Reinsurance Group ensures risks that no one else has the desire or the capital to take on. The operation combines capacity, speed, decisiveness, and most importantly, brains in a manner unique in the insurance business. So I called Berkshire Hathaway and I talked to the secretary of the group to see if they had any uranium mining policies, and they don't. And, and basically the uranium mining industry and has not a very good reputation that's going to be attractive to the insurance industry to ensure the record is not very good. Um, so. Why Virginia Uranium Inc. has proposed to the General Assembly is to say, well, we'll give you a bond and, and you'll put it away and that will cover any potential mishaps that happen. Um, because the reality is that um, uranium mining around the world has always had some type of contamination. They talk about ALERA, which stands for as low as reasonably achievable, which means they're not going to achieve 100% safety. They know it. And the scientists that work at the National Academy of Science report said, it's not if an environmental catastrophe will happen, it's when, and how it's contained, and how it's handled, if we adventure on that. So the whole private insurance industry that's built on spreading risk is not touching this. So is uranium a good investment? Uh, uranium might be, so this is, it might be hard, this is from the National Academy of Science Report. And this shows the boom and bust of the uranium industry going up and down. And this shows in 2007, 2008, it's up here over $100 a pound. Um, that was when they first started coming down here to Southside Virginia and saying, we think your deposit's inter interesting. We think that might be a good investment. But notice after this, it goes down. And it kind of pops up and goes down again. So uranium mining was worth exploring in 2007, 
when the price of uranium spiked due to the hedge fund speculation to over $100 a pound. Those that follow the stock market remember what happened in 2007, 2008 with the hedge funds that left our economy in tangles, well, in ruins, I guess would be more the world word. Six years, later, the <clears throat> Six years later, the uranium prices are fluctuating around $44 a pound. An analysis of the global market reveals a bleak future for the uranium commodity. Virginia Uranium Inc. has made many erroneous claims, but the most preposterous one is that a Coles Hills deposit is currently worth an estimated $7 billion. <coughs> Uranium ore at Coles Hills is considered a low-grade ore that is not worth mining unless the market price is higher than the cost of extracting and processing it. Estimates vary that the startup cost of mining and milling the ore at Coles Hill would be between $60 to $80 a pound. The Chimera report said that around $45 a pound might be the break-even point. Therefore, the current value of the Coles Hill deposit is worthless based on today's market price. The parent company of Virginia Uranium Inc., Virginia Energy Resources Inc. of Vancouver, Canada, is in fiscal distress. It had an operating loss of over $5 million and has an accumulated deficit of over $17 million, according to Canada's System for Electronic Document Analysis and Retrieval for the period ended September 30th, 2012. Recent financial restructuring using bridge loans does not address that their major holding, Coles Hill, is essentially worthless. But what about future market projections? So let's look at what the rest of the world right now is working on, because maybe it might come back up. So I looked at the global energy efficiency um, that just came out. This is a scorecard from 2012. And, um, we're number nine right now in the world. China's number six. Uh, the United, United Kingdom's number one. And I picked Germany to examine. It's number two, but I thought Germany would be a good one to look at as far as being kind of similar to Virginia, kind of. Um, but also because Germany's economy is doing very well compared with the rest of Europe and pretty stabilized throughout the world. How do you measure efficiency, please? There's what are a, those colors? The, um, the green is the most energy efficient in the yellow. In terms yellow. of what? Um, it has to do with um, national effort, buildings, industry, transportation. Uh, green ranks 1 through 4, yellow ranks 5 through 8, and red ranks 9 through 12. And it's the ACEE, International Energy So is this some kind of measure of energy that used per capita, or? They do a scorecard based on the, the, the amount of effort, like the of national effort that's being put into it, also what the buildings are doing, um, the industry and the transportation. Um, it, it is the ACEE, International Energy Efficiency Scorecard, and I apologize, I don't remember what ACEE stands for right now, um, but as I go into deeper into what's happening with Germany, maybe you'll see a picture of why so we that. among the least efficient on the globe. Yeah, we're not doing very well. Yeah, that's not <laughs> We could do better. No question. So the Germans are investing in solar power. That's a picture of the solar farm. Um, the Germans have a goal by 2022 of going nuclear free. And one of the major reasons of um, how they're going to be in position to do that is they've been exercising something called a passive house construction. And the passive house construction has studies that show um, that using passive measure alone showed a potential energy savings in the range of 90 percent. So that is one-tenth of what it used to be. So if you can imagine your heating and cooling expenses for your home and for your business being reduced to one-tenth of what they are now, you can see where you wouldn't need as much energy going into that. But you could also see economically where if you had that 90%, you could spend it on all sorts of things. Um, 
the, the Germans aren't the only ones doing it. There's actually a building at Virginia Tech that has used this construction. There's a high school at Franklin County that has used this construction. And just recently, a dental office opened in Roanoke using this construction. So we have this here in Southwest Virginia. Um, and you can also retrofit buildings to this too. And that's a job creator. Um, solar energy, the German solar power plants <coughs> produced a world record 22 gigawatts of electricity equal to 20 nuclear power stations at full capacity this past spring. The director of the Institute of Renewable Energy Industry in Munster said that the 22 gigawatts of solar power fed into the national grid on Saturday that nearly 50% of the nation's midday electricity needs. Um, the Germans also have the most efficient wood stoves in the world. And um, they are um, investing in wind and wind power. They are working to connect offshore cables to wind turbines and hope to have wind power contribute to 15% of Germany's energy needs by 2030. Um, they have already shut down seven of their nuclear reactors, and after doing so, they're still able to export energy to their neighbors. The Italians and the Swiss are also looking at going nuclear free. So this is another chart from the National Academy of Science report that's talking about um, the low and high case scenario of uranium needs. This is the low case scenario, this is the high case. Right now, um, nuclear energy accounts for only 20% of the United States' electricity needs. And there are other sources for uranium than mining it out of the ground. Uh, one is recovering uranium from phosphate, phosphate mining. Um, you can also recover uranium from coal ash. Uranium and thorium can be byproducts from titanium and zirconium mining. And Virginia is the second highest producer of titanium and zirconia which makes me wonder how much is being left over of uranium and thorium where they're mining titanium and zircon zirconium. Who's inspecting that and what's happening with that product? I don't know. I started researching this and I got more questions <laughs> as I kept going along of wondering, um, you know, what is happening there. So this is where I am right now, but I am curious about that. Um, the United States um, doesn't reprocess spent nuclear fuel rods, but Germany, Japan, Russia, Belgium, France, and Switzerland do. Um, you also need a reliable supply of water for nuclear energy, so if, if you're in a place where there's a drought, whether you have a nuclear power plant or you have a mining operation that needs to cover the tailings, the tailings are what's left over a, mail, a milling operation. It's, um, it's been described as being like talcum powder. They cover it with water to keep it from blowing around. That's what's supposed to be left for tens of thousands of years. So having a steady supply of water is very important. Now 38% of Virginia's energy comes from nuclear energy. Um, if uranium was mined in Virginia, then the product would enter the global market, just like oil drilled in the US enters <coughs> the global market. The US has exported more oil than it imports over the last two years. Um, now, when I heard Patrick Wales making a presentation, he was saying that um, Virginia Uranium Inc. would try and make a, a deal with one of the nuclear plants in Virginia or Ohio or nearby to make it where they would have a definite market for their product. And that sounds good, but they're going to be looking for a good deal. They don't care where it comes from. We're a capitalist society. so. Um, I talked with an energy expert, and she said whatever deal they make, it's going to be based on what the global price is. This is a recent um, Wall Street Journal energy graphic that just came out um, like a week or two ago. Was, and this shows coal on the blue is um, 2011, the orange is 2012. So coal, the energy produced from that dropped 13.6%. Uh, natural gas it went up 23.6%. And what um, utilities are discovering is it's less expensive and less risky for them to um, purchase natural gas than it is for them to use um, nuclear power, uranium, uh, or coal. Um, and the nuclear energy um, actually went down 2.5% usage 
in our country. So power for a bright future. Um, China is an up-and-coming in industrial country. It's, it's getting electricity entering the world. Um, right now, China's commitment um, is to build many nuclear power plants. Um, and that initially fueled the speculation in the uranium market. So they're like, well, China's getting ready to come online. They're going to need uranium. However, China has invested over $300 million in 160 scientists with PhDs to create the world's first thorium-powered nuclear reactor by 2017. Thorium is a more stable and less toxic fuel than uranium. And thorium is more prevalent and less expensive than Europe. Um, I'm sorry, the Japan, the United Kingdom, Norway, and India are also investigating thorium nuclear energy. The primary advantage of thorium is the fact that almost the entire metal has the potential to be spent in a nuclear reaction versus 0.7% potential of natural uranium in today's thermal reactors. This means that the possibility exists for far less nuclear waste to dispose of. There are a number of attractive features to develop thorium-powered nuclear fuels. It is an abundant resource available in many countries. It produces power without as many long-lived transuranic elements as part of the waste. And it generally reduces the amount of radioactive waste produced from generating power. So is it fair? Um, one of the photos that Virginia Uranium Inc. often uses in their slide presentation is of a Canadian mining facility um, in Saskatchewan that's surrounded by a bunch of lakes. It's proof that you can mine uranium in a wet climate. However, I contacted the Saskatchewan Weather Service where they confirmed that it was melting glaciers, snowfall, and an occasional rainfall that formed their lakes. Now that would provide a reliable, steady source of water, not subject to drought, because the glaciers take a long time to melt, and you know where the melt-off is going to go. The Canadian environment is drier and colder than Virginia's climate, which is subjected to tropical rain depressions, hurricanes, earthquakes, and tornadoes. Last year, approximately two million of our taxpayer money was spent on the Uranium Working Group. This year, the uranium industry is asking the governor to ignore the will of the General Assembly and to have state agencies develop regulations for mining uranium in Virginia at an estimated cost of $4 million for an operation that is not economically viable. We have better ways to invest our tax dollars to help and protect our citizens. The Child Health Investment Partnership hasn't been fully funded since 2009. This year they are hoping to have less than a million dollars restored from the state budget to help young children. The bridges in our state keep being downgraded for the amount of tonnage allowed to cross them. And that's where I want you to remember the slide of the tractor trailer with the school bus next to it. So a tractor trailer might be pulling a load where it has the tonnage allowed to cross a bridge. But what if the school bus happens to be crossing that bridge at the same time? What happens then? We know it can potentially happen then, and it's unacceptable. In the foreseeable future, the possible private benefits do not outweigh the risk of public exposure. That's what I have. <laughs> so, if you have any questions. Yes? Well, there was a recent article in the New Yorker where students at uh, University of Chicago it took thorium that was in a, uh, a vacuum tube tubes and made into uranium that was high grade possible uh, to nuclear uh, potential as far as uh, you know we're worried about a neighbor. So that's one way to do it. 
The other thing is, uh, I'm from Binghamton, New York. And Binghamton and Elmira, New York, sit on the Marcellus Shale. They have, by you know, Governor Como, a uh, thing that you can't uh, uh, put, put fracking over there. But on the other side, the town of Tawanda and other towns over there, they, they've had a, a boom. But we really don't know what the problems with uh, fracking could be. So uh, New York has been uh, uh, hesitant to uh, go into this thing because of the problem. My thing is, with this, is, there's what, dust and whatnot, uh, airborne, <coughs> airborne contamination. And with the winds and all this sort of stuff, Roanoke might be affected <coughs> by the mining. I mean, there's dust, dirt, stuff like this that goes up in the air. And that's why I'm strongly at, at, against it. <coughs> Because I have no idea that anybody who mines or blasts or d does this sort of stuff. Because I worked on an I had a power project in 1956 when it blew up all this sort of stuff. And I mean, it's lucky I don't have silicosis of the lung for what I, uh, uh, you know, breathe in when I was working on that uh, power project in 56. So I just, this is my feelings on it, that it's something that should be uh, not done. Yeah, well one of the concerns that I have, and, and maybe Dr. Bonner can um, say how much might have happened, but I was kind of taken aback when I was reading the National Academy of Science report to learn how many holes, there's, there's quite a few holes that have been dug through exploratory drilling um, in Southside Virginia, and the moratorium says clearly in the statute that um, you're not supposed to permanently alter the, the surface of the earth. And um, Virginia Uranium Inc. has been taking long core samples out of the earth and storing them in a storage shed and filling them up with concrete. Well, my definition of that is permanently altering the surface because if you can't put back what you put in, um, then that's different. Um, so I've, I've asked, and there's been no independent um, inspections, there's nothing in place to monitor that for the public. Um, currently right now the statute in Virginia is you only have to notify your neighbors within a thousand feet of when you want to do exploratory drilling for a mine um, and then they have 10 days to give notice to put any objection of that and I think that's um, way too little <laughs> territory and not enough time for the public to respond whatever type of mine it is even if it's a zirconian and titanium mine, I would want to know um, that that was happening near one of our farms because um, apparently uranium and thorium is a byproduct <laughs> of that. And there's, you know, we're getting more and more information now. And, and I, I hear your concerns about what we did in the 1950s or the 40s. Um, the fellow that lived next to my grandfather worked on the Manhattan Project and he used to um, do little experiments like, um, splitting atoms. <laughs> <laughs> we don't do that anymore, <laughs> and a lot of the reasons why, why we don't do that is we learn that that's not a, not a good thing to do. Um, so we're always learning and growing. Um, basically, the um, point of my presentation was um, there is a lot to be concerned about with um, environment, with health, um, but what I haven't heard much discussion in with debate is, is it economically viable? Are we even talking about something that's even possibly going to happen? And my conclusion is, is that it's not going to happen because the price of a commodity, it drops if the demand drops. And if the Germans, the Italians, and the Swiss are going nuke free, and China, and Japan, and Norway, and the United Kingdom, and India are going thorium, where's the demand for uranium? Um, it's already at $44 a pound. I don't see it going back up, at least not enough to make it the $60 to $80 of the, of the startup costs for Coles Hill. Uh, I have a two-part question there, and I honestly do not know the answer to this, but wonder if you know the answer. Do you think, first part, do you foresee 
any possible way in the future that people could come up with ways of mining uranium, protecting the public exposure. Can you foresee technology or the process ever getting to a point where it would be safe? And the second part of this same question is the same question about oil, which is horrible for public exposure, and gasoline, and fracking, and wind power has a lot of opponents, and, and the turbines out at sea to generate power have a lot of opponents. It, is there any possible hope for developing uranium or nuclear power in the future? But if the answer is no, wouldn't the same thing be the case for every single other means of developing a source for electricity? Well, um, for the first part of the question, um, I could potentially see if we could evolve to a place where our robots were doing the mining and monitoring and, and you took the human factor out of it, maybe because of getting back to the turkey story. and. and there was reasons why I showed the slides of the tit um, Titanic, the Exxon, and the Miracle on the Hudson. That all involved human beings with each one of those scenarios. So as long as you have human beings in charge of uranium mining and milling and transport, there's always going to be that human misjudgment and negligence that's going to be a part of that. And I did have a reason for showing um, the Brooklyn Bridge and the Space Shuttle. I do have faith in humanity that we will find a way to have our needs met for energy that may be beyond our imagination actually right now. And I think a lot of it's going to be in the development of solar energy because they say that solar energy, if you have a spill, it's called a sunny day. <laughs> so. No, but it ruins the countryside to put up all those collectors. Right. It destroys the pasture land. And well, um, other countries are finding a way to do it, and a lot of it comes to um, the comfort with change. And if you look at something and look at it as a place of beauty, or if you look at it and, and you're disturbed by it, it just, um, it changes. Am I, did you can I, put it on your roof, though, Larry. We well, you did, if there are other questions, we can take them in from like the other speaker oh, yeah. Yeah. before it gets too late, and then there will be time for questions. Off, sure. Our next speaker is Dr. Robert J. Bodner. He is a native of Pennsylvania.